It is Friday, December 22nd, and this is The National. Tonight, Loblaw's bread price-fixing controversy is getting uglier. We look at the lawsuits, the angry CEOs, and the new social media campaign. As Sears Canada clears the shelves at the end of a 65-year run, career employees tell us what they think the country is about to lose. Well, let's begin with another sexual misconduct scandal. We've seen the floodgates burst open in a few short months, from Hollywood to media to politics, powerful giants in their industries suddenly facing multiple allegations of sexual misconduct or assault. The latest industry is classical music and the latest giant, world-renowned conductor Charles Dutoir. Canadians might know him best for his 25 years as principal conductor of the Montreal Symphony Orchestra. Dutois has 10 Juno Awards and two Grammys, and he's an honorary officer of the Order of Canada. Now, though, one symphony after another, from San Francisco to Sydney, has either cut ties with Dutois or announced he's stepping away from upcoming performances. The CBC's Ron Charles has more. What a wonderful Grammy Award-winning soprano Sylvia McNair is one of four women accusing world-renowned conductor Charles Dutois of sexual assault. McNair told the Associated Press that Dutois pushed her against an elevator wall and pressed his knee between her legs in 1985 after a Minnesota rehearsal. Mezzo-soprano Paula Rasmussen told AP Dutois pushed her against the dressing room wall and forced her hand down his pants in Los Angeles in 1991. Two other women who asked AP to not identify them gave similar details about Dutois between 2006 and 2010. 81-year-old Dutois is best known in Canada for his quarter-century tenure as conductor at the Montreal Symphony Orchestra. It was during that time that journalist Natasha Gauthier remembers showing up for a 1995 interview with Dutois. He leaned closer and he was trying to, you know, touch my knee and then he grabbed my hand at one point and wanted to hold my hand. Gauthier says she described Dutois' behavior in the article she wrote for French-language news magazine L'Actualité. He was known to behave like this, but nobody did anything. Certainly nothing happened to him. Uh, there were repercussions on me. I was blacklisted from, from covering him and the orchestra. A statement today from the Montreal Symphony says the management that is now in place was not in function when Gauthier's article was published, and that the new management has not received any complaints of sexual harassment by Mr. Dutois. <laughs> Dutois has been dropped from or pulled out of performances by at least seven symphonies around the world, including his current orchestra, London's Royal Philharmonic, which said the truth should be determined by the courts. Neither Dutois nor his management company would comment today. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Well, let's see, Adrian, let's move on now to a much different story and for some Canadians, a much happier story. Indeed, a little bit bittersweet though, Ian, because for the first time, the Olympic sport of luge is tainted by doping. Today, the International Olympic Committee disqualified two members of Russia's relay team, which now forfeits the silver medal it won four years ago in Sochi, back when four Canadians were crushed by their apparent failure to make the podium. I think the pain is to come up a tenth short, another fourth place. It's, it's a bit of a shock right now still. I feel awful that we, we didn't get the job done. Well, justice may be slow, but it has arrived for these Canadians who are now bronze medal winners. Farah Morali looks at what that means. There's the pad, and here come Walker and Smith. In the sport of luge, a tenth of a second can be the difference between this and this. For four years, that moment on the track in Sochi has haunted this Canadian luge relay team. That all changed today with a stunning announcement. The IOC declared that two of these Russian team members have been disqualified. In a statement, it said they are found to have committed anti-doping rule violations and are disqualified from the events in which they participated. That means the fourth place team of Sam Edney, Alex Gao, Justin Smith and Albert Tristan Walker should now be awarded bronze medals. And so they had seen the same thing I saw on their phones and all that type of thing and uh, they were excited too. But same thing, cautiously, you know, happy and, you know, a high five, then back to work. 
If the Canadians are awarded a bronze, it would be Canada's first Olympic luge medal. And while it's a cause for celebration, some say that moment has already passed. There are so many implications to not winning a medal, and one for the athletes, they don't get to live that moment. I mean, assuming that everything goes the way uh, it, it's moving forward, they, they will have their Olympic medals, but they never got their Olympic moment to be that medalist. That missed feeling is something Christine Girard knows well. They renamed the uh, weightlifting uh, room in my hometown with my name. The two-time Olympian was three kilograms away from winning a bronze medal in the 2008 Beijing Olympics for weightlifting. Last summer, she learned because of doping disqualifications, she would be moved to third place. When I came back in Canada with a fourth place, I was being seen as a failure and I was feeling like a failure. And then eight years later, that failure was becoming a success. But like for those four years, like how much support, how much how much sponsor, how much help should I have had? And I didn't. I think this is going to be a battle for the bronze. The Canadian luge team will have another shot at Olympic glory in February when they compete in Pyeongchang. And as for those possible bronze medals they've earned, Girard says they should be prepared to wait a little bit longer. She still hasn't received hers. Because <laughs> I've been waiting for a year and a half, so hopefully it will be quicker for them. Farah Morali, CBC News, Vancouver. You might be wondering, how do performance-enhancing drugs help you go downhill faster? So much depends on that first burst out of the gate. It can all be lost or won in that moment. It may seem like gravity does all the rest of the work, but it takes real strength to withstand the G-forces while taking tight turns at high speeds. And just as with sprinters, performance-enhancing drugs can amp that strength and speed just enough to shave fractions off times. And the podium is all about the time. When you account for all the dopers who've been caught out since Sochi, Canada's medal standings have a lot more luster. At the end of the Games, Canada was in fourth place overall. Now with Russian cheaters knocked out of the running, Canada climbs to third place overall. And this country is second only to Norway when it comes to winning gold all of which is a good sign for Canada in Pyeongchang. Now we have an update tonight on that Ukrainian government official accused of spying for the Russians. Stanislav Yezhov will remain in a Ukraine jail while the investigation continues. He had been working as an aide and interpreter for the country's prime minister. That job gave him access to a series of high-profile meetings, including one in October with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Today, Canada's public safety minister responded. It's an operational matter, uh, which uh, I don't discuss in public, but I do want to make it clear that, uh, that uh, our security and uh, police services, uh, in all circumstances, including this one, uh, have done their job very well. Ukrainian journalists are now reporting that the security establishment there allegedly first got interested in the interpreter back in the spring and has ever since has been actively trying to use him to plant disinformation. So spies trying to turn spies. We have an update tonight on a story from earlier this year. CBC News has learned that a former sailor is suing the military, claiming exposure to mold aboard two warships has given him a debilitating lung condition. Murray Brewster has more in the lawsuit and why the Navy says its sailors have no cause for concern. Since leaving the Navy, this has been Alan Doucette's life. This is Ventolin. Uh, this is for opening my lungs, for if I'm experiencing a severe coughing fit. He was diagnosed with hyperactive airway disorder. These are two of the main prescriptions that i gotten uh, since when I got my lung injury. His doctors say it was brought on by constant exposure to black mold while serving on two Navy warships almost a decade ago. Veterans Affairs says his condition is attributable to service. Now, Doucette has filed a lawsuit in federal court against the military to compensate for his lost career. The statement of claim accuses the Navy of systemic negligence. Officials knew or ought to have known about the staggering mold growth on both HMCS Athabascan and HMCS Iroquois. This is just the beginning. We expect there to be a widespread proof that the Navy did not disclose to people like Lieutenant Doucette 
that as early as 2004, when he was on the Iroquois, his health was at risk. The Navy has always insisted there have been no reports of health concerns. CBC News first reported Doucette's case last summer. And since the summer of 2016, we have asked the Navy for environmental and health quality assessments on the ships. There's been no reply. The Navy would not comment on the lawsuit. It insists, however, it's taking action. A major hazardous quality air assessment was conducted on board HMCS Winnipeg last summer. It revealed something significant. We had few compartments, uh, three to be exact, where uh, the mold levels were a little bit higher than what is accepted. These pictures of HMCS Regina were recently taken by concerned sailors. Should they be worried? I don't think so. While sailors are being told to carry on, the Navy issued two new directives just recently. One for steam systems that create humidity. The other for mold detection, prevention and cleanup. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. You have probably heard the grocery giant Loblaw admitted to price fixing with bread and that they'll be offering customers $25 grocery cards as a goodwill gesture. So just for the sake of argument, imagine if every Canadian adult got a card and then donated it to a food bank. That is precisely what a social media campaign is urging people to do, and that would add up to about $715 million. The CBC's Cameron McIntosh talked to some people who would love to see something like that take hold. At one of Canada's busiest food banks, the impact of high food prices is easy to see. Winnipeg Harvest feeds 64,000 people a month. So an admission of price fixing in the grocery industry resonates. It is a little bit troubling, you know, considering that, you know, all of our food gets donated to us. Loblaw has apologized for fixing the price of bread products. It's offering affected customers a $25 grocery card. That's prompted an online push. Celebrity financial advisor Gail Vaz Oxlade taking to Twitter, urging everybody, absolutely everybody in Canada, sign up, then send the cards to the food bank. It's getting traction. Still, that doesn't make this a good news story for Loblaw. The $25 gift certificate uh, ploy is really a PR move uh, from Loblaw uh, just to basically um, window wash what is actually happening underneath. While it's not clear if there will be long-term damage to its brands, Loblaw estimates the grocery cards will cost up to $150 million. Meanwhile, a class action lawsuit is already in the works filed by a Northern Ontario anti-poverty activist who scoffs at the cards. What do you think this should be worth to Canadians? A few hundred dollars, yeah, per family for sure. Because that's 14 years worth of bread. What's the message to Loblaw here? Don't mess around with families. Two of Loblaw's competitors sent a don't mess with us message today. The CEOs of Sobeys and Metro are accusing Loblaw of dragging them into the scandal by calling bread price fixing industry-wide. Sobeys even suggested legal action. That's something you don't see a lot, is sort of CEO to CEO publicly sort of firing shots. Loblaw says it's cooperating with the Competition Bureau, but by fessing up, it's gained immunity. It won't be penalized for fixing the price of bread. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. And registration for Loblaw's $25 grocery card begins January 8th. If you give the company your email address now, it will send you a reminder. You can enter loblawcard.ca into your browser and follow the instructions. Once registration is open, you'll need to declare that you're 18 or older and that you bought certain bread products before March of 2015. Imagine your 92-year-old mom is coming home for the holidays and then disappears in transit. One distraught daughter was at Ottawa's International Airport waiting for both her mother and an explanation. I'm Ann Miller, the daughter of Eleanor Miller. So my mother was scheduled to fly out of Asheville, North Carolina. United Airlines had told us that she had never boarded her flight in Asheville, which prompted us then to believe she was lost. After several torturous hours, Ann Miller found her mother, but the mishap raises some serious questions about what actually happened and why it was so difficult for the Millers to get help. Evan Dyer explains. To be quite honest, I was terrified. I thought something very drastic had happened to her. 
Ann Miller says her mother, Eleanor, never came off the plane she was expecting to see her on. But what really worried her was when United Airlines denied she'd been on any flight. Either she had never made it to the airport or she had been in an accident on the way to the airport or had taken ill at the airport and had been transported to a hospital. Eleanor Miller left home in Asheville, North Carolina on Wednesday morning, only to find her flight to Newark was delayed. By the time she landed in Newark, her connection to Ottawa was long gone. So United put her up in a hotel in New Jersey and booked her on a flight next day. She also called her daughter, who was very relieved, and cancelled the missing persons report she'd filed with Asheville police. So I slept the night away, got up in the morning, got dressed, had some breakfast downstairs, and went to the airport, and uh, they had my suitcase, and it was on the plane. And but the same thing happened plane. again. United insisted from the get-go that she had never boarded the plane and that she was not on the plane and not their responsibility. But in fact, Eleanor Miller was on the flight and mother and daughter were finally reunited. In a statement today, United did say sorry. We've since spoken with our customer and her family to apologize for giving them inaccurate information and have provided compensation and upgraded seating for her return flights. Eleanor Miller says she's just glad it's over. It was just yesterday that was really upsetting and making me wish, why did I ever do this? <laughs> Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Still ahead on The National, tis the season for some groundbreaking medical discoveries. Why reindeer antlers can help heal wounds. Plus, in a little more than three weeks, Sears Canada closes its doors for good. I talked to four longtime employees in Peterborough, Ontario, about what it means for them and small cities across Canada. And they were under plenty of Christmas trees in the early 90s. Could be again this year. Why a throwback Nintendo is all the rage. When you play this, it brings you back many years and you feel like a kid again. And those yeah. were the best times of our lives. We want to relive it. What's wrong with this picture? Sure, the halls are all decked with boughs of holly. The carols come at you from all sides. But St. Nick, he's nowhere, banished from the aisles of this department store. His day job cancelled at this mall. His hours cut way back. And will you find a ho, ho, ho at this company's Christmas party? No, no, no. Why not? No money. So what happened to the Christmas spirit? I love Christmas, and uh, it's always been a very big part of my life. And I always wanted people to think that it to feel that way too. We all enjoyed it. We always had fun. And uh, yeah, I feel like a, a real cheapskate. Santa, say it isn't so. It is. It is kind of tough that, uh, you know, Santas are slowly dying in a way uh, through uh, cutbacks. The man in red, a victim of businesses in the red. Brian Wenham is Winnipeg's biggest Santa supplier. His bookings are down by almost a half. All because companies are less profitable, mind you. Merry Not because he's any less popular. Hello, how are you? Hello, boy. Hello. And frankly, most companies are rather, well, embarrassed about the lack of Santas. Sure, in private, they'll tell you why they've cut back, but not if there's a camera around. And a few businesses, which have always had Santas, now have elaborate explanations. I, I don't know if I should be saying this on TV, but uh, pretty tough to have a Santa Claus in our store and one in the mall and then one at Eaton's and one in the next mall and that sort of thing. How do you explain that to the kids? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Still, even now, there's goodwill toward store managers. Maybe times will get better and then there'll be more Santas out there. And In the meantime, Pace Setter Clothing is making its employees red Christmas stockings. On the National Tonight, some breaking news on the investigation into last week's plane crash in northern Saskatchewan. Transport Canada has grounded the airline because of safety concerns. 
Just a little while ago, the government of Canada's media account had this on Twitter. Transport Canada has suspended West Wind Aviation's air operator certificate in the interest of public safety. And Transport Canada tweeted, we'll continue to work with West Wind Aviation as it brings itself into compliance with aviation safety regulations. West Wind released a statement tonight saying it has voluntarily and preemptively suspended flying operations. Right now, it's not clear what the safety problems are, nor when the airline might fly again. But we do know that remote communities in northern Saskatchewan rely on those services. The plane that crashed last week had just taken off from Fond du Lac, a flying community near the Northwest Territories. We're working tonight to find out more about the impact of this suspension. Now we've got a reindeer story that has no mention of Rudolph. These beasts cannot fly, but scientists think there might be power in their antlers. Carolyn Dunn explains what they're hoping to find. There's a bit of magic in these reindeer antlers. No, not the sleigh-pulling kind, but researchers think the kind that perhaps can heal. So why do you think the antler and what the antler is able to do might have some applications in human wound healing. So one of the interesting things about the about the antler is is the rate of growth uh, that this this organ is formed. So as it's moving out of the out of the skull, it's actually growing at a rate of one centimeter a day, if not more. So this is hundreds of thousands, if not millions of cells that are being generated very rapidly. We wondered whether the skin itself, not not the entire antler, but just a velvet might hold some unique regenerative properties in itself. So for the past four years, veterinarians have been intentionally wounding the animals, under anesthetic, of course. We make a small wound in this skin, um, and then we make the same kind of a wound on the back skin or anywhere else on the body. The, the velvet wounds actually regenerate almost perfectly. And so when you go back three weeks later, you can, it's really difficult to find where the wound is. Scarless. Right, it's, it's, almost, it's almost scarless. Uh, but if you look at the, the, the wound that you made, say, on the back skin, it forms a very robust scar, almost what, exactly what you would see on human skin. Now to try to understand how that happens, we're isolating cells from the velvet and from the back skin and then studying them in the laboratory in order to, to understand uh, on, on more of a, a molecular level how they might be different and how they might, they might respond differently to an injury. Here's a cross-section image of that scarred back skin. The wound is empty, the skin is destroyed permanently. Now here's the velvet after it's healed. Virtually no scar and everything has regenerated. Skin, hair follicles, even glands. Even though the science is still in research stage, burn specialist Dr. Vincent Gabriel calls this kind of discovery science essential. For people that have injuries that destroy all the layers of the skin, despite having all of our available resources, there is no way for us to return skin's function to the way it was pre-injury. As a result, people frequently have injuries to the hands or face. Functional regions they end up in lifelong scarring. So whatever we can do to learn and advance our science, the better we'll be. Being a burn survivor, I know how much it means to so many people. A dozen years ago, Don Adamson survived third degree burns to 50% of his body. Now a national advocate for burn survivors, Adamson is excited about the potential in research like the Reindeer Project for future patients. Being burned is a full-time thing. It never goes away. And uh, if you can uh, give someone a better quality of life because they have better mobility and uh, they don't look as scarred, uh, it's a, really a big thing. The five-year study is expected to be published next year. Of course, it would be years beyond that for any human application. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, near Calgary. Still ahead on The National, this is the latest Star Wars video game, an almost cinematic experience. What gamers expect these days. So why are so many going for this? Eli Glasner reveals the retro gaming revolution. We're grown men, um, sort of. But we're not alone, and these systems are selling out. So what's, what's driving this? Honestly, it's just... Nostalgia.
Well, life is a highway. It is a highway. Tom Cochran's been driving fast these days, fueled by his current number one album, Mad Mad World. He was born in Manitoba, raised in Toronto, and Tom Cochran's been recording for 17 years. A thoughtful songwriter, Cochran's always brought a Canadian perspective to his observations. He's just finished a cross-country tour, and boy, are his arms tired. And uh, here's something from his, it's the newest release from his album, it's called No Regrets. appropriate you are on fire there you go well you number one this yeah. must just you must go I don't get it I've been putting this stuff yeah. out for 17 years and all of a sudden it just clicks I guess I'm gonna have to get get used to being something other than the underdog you know but it's 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 real flattering you know it's it's uh, you know in a tough market I've never done anything conventionally at Valerie it's it's uh, kind of like going to Yellowknife to golf but um, you know, it's it's tough out there economically, and I really appreciate the support of the fans. And obviously, you know, obviously we've got to, we're building on that. You know, so <clears throat> it's a bit of a shocker. You never know how a record's going to do, and you try not to think about it. You just, but, you know, I mean, try to write music. You've been successful, but you, you haven't been successful. You haven't been number one. When you say not that, not number one in this market with Michael Jackson, Brian Adams, and you two. Uh, you know, it's it's pretty. Uh, you just happen to mention pretty, that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> overwhelming tell me about Tom um, life is a highway it's such a great song but and it's such an up song but, but the inspiration from it came from a, a trip to Ethiopia you had which yeah we well Africa Ethiopia and Mozambique Zimbabwe and Kenya and you know the thing that 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 I was left with uh, you know I did a lot of press and a lot of uh, work uh, afterwards for World Vision and you know it was it was really draining emotionally but the, the thing that 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 I was left with three three four weeks after coming home and, and that spawned um, the lyrics in the song, not that the song is directly about the experience, but the song is about um, that feeling that the people left me with it, that uh, in spite of all the hardships and, and in spite of how tough it got, they're tremendously resilient. The people over there are, are just wonderful and the, and the joy they find in the simple things in life when, when they, you know, when, when things are going okay and they can't function, they live for the moment, you know, and you come back here and we find everything in the West to complain about and worry about, you know, and we can learn learn from that so that's you know I wanted to write a song that would make people feel good make them realize that okay you just gotta be positive and move ahead and try to spread a little bit of you know goodwill when you can and, and treat people in good faith and, and things will work out and learn from the negative experiences so that that's what you know kind of the song was spawned out of and I, I was purging myself I suppose of a lot of the Western guilt yeah we're you know, so and, lucky and, I have so much food it makes yeah, me but, feel awful but I mean these things uh, you know, we deal with them. I'm not, I'm not saying to ignore the problems. We, I think, you know, in privileged countries like Canada, we have a duty to, to uh, help out. But, you know, I am saying that, you know, to, to get, to be debilitated or, or to get sidetracked up, yeah. with these negative emotions, it's not productive. So. This is dedicated yeah. to your mom and dad. Yeah. I always find that so sweet. Well, because this is, uh, <laughs> you, you put out what 20 that. of these? Yeah. Do you dedicate them all to your mom and dad, or I do you just finally 20. get around to them? This is my eighth record. It was a much better time for Sears back in 1997 when that ad was running. This is the final Christmas for what was one of Canada's great department stores. In a moment, we'll hear from four longtime employees about what made Sears so important to their small city. But first, a quick look back. Simpson Sears was a joint venture of a couple of retail giants. This store in the Vancouver suburb of Burnaby was one of the first, opening in 1954. People all across Canada get the money's worth that Sears. By the 70s, the chain was known as Sears Canada. You could get just about anything you wanted here, and you could return it too. 
No questions asked. I just don't see why a customer would want to shop any other place but Sears. Cause Sears believes... No matter where you lived, there was the wish book, the catalog, supported by a massive and complex system and controlled by a computer that took up an entire floor of an office building. Sears played an especially important role in smaller cities like Peterborough, Ontario, both to customers and staff who could enjoy varied careers without leaving their hometown. But in this city, about two hours northeast of Toronto and across the country, Sears will close forever one month from now. Last week, I went to Peterborough to talk to four former employees about what they'll miss about Sears and what they loved, beginning with the wish book. So describe, like, what is it about Sears that made it special? The merchandise was aimed at the middle income families. Mm -hmm. So most people could afford to shop there for their families. Mm -hmm. I think talking to all of you, one of, one of the special things you mentioned, and a lot of Canadians can relate to this, is the wish book. Uh, Ruth, as, as an employee, what, what was it like? What, what did the catalog mean to you? Well, it was Christmas in, in particular was a very exciting time for catalog because there were so many, the volume of sales, of course, and uh, everyone wanted that wish book. We had to have a card. There was cards mailed to every, all the customers in town, and they were very sought after items. <clears throat> so people would come in the store yeah. looking for their catalog they and sometimes the they, they and couldn't get it. Sometimes they couldn't get it and they wouldn't be happy. <laughs> so um, we had the groundwork for online sales through our wish book. You sure did, yeah. And all the other catalogs because yeah. they came out almost every month. Yeah. But, of course, you couldn't make the, the orders online. Uh, Brenda, you were in the room with, what, you said 60 women on the phone? Yeah, and we all had little cubicles, and we took orders um, on the phone, and then they were mailed off to Toronto, and then the parcels would come back. People had to take numbers when they came to pick their parcels up, especially at Christmas. And Another benefit of the catalog uh, was the retail sales that that we got from it yes. because these people coming in to pick up their parcels etc they would then be shopping at the retail level as well so it you know was great for catalog business but it was also great for uh, our store retail mm -hmm. businesses as ruth was saying sears was kind of ahead of its day when it came to to you know what turned into online sales Sears was a place that, that a, a young woman, a 15-year-old girl from Peterborough could start a career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they gave me my chance and, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, I worked my way up to full-time to assistant manager of uh, fashion accessories. And uh, it, as the girls have said, we had lots of training, always training, always going to the other stores to see how things were done. Just a great place to work. Some of the department stores of the day, Sears being one, I think Eaton's as well, famous for the fact that you could take anything back, no questions asked. But on the other side of the counter, sometimes that was a little bit frustrating. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> You're being very careful now. <laughs> well, I worked in retail a long time, so I had to be careful a lot of times. Our, our yeah. slogan was satisfaction guaranteed yeah. or money refunded, and we did everything that we could to make that happen. Which a lot of customers appreciated. Yes. Well, it was what cu customers counted on. Yes. And that's why we had the business we did for so many years. And a few customers took advantage of? A few customers take advantage of anything but the vast majority did not. And we had loyal shoppers, loyal customers, uh, generations of customers yeah. actually. And some of them you actually got to know by name and, oh, yes. and they got to know us by name yeah. too. So I've asked all of you, you know, kind of stories about nostalgia and, and Maureen, you have an interesting experience when it comes to Cabbage Patch dolls. Yes, I was in the toy department at that time and I wasn't manager, I was just a full-time person. And, uh, of course, we ran out of them, and everybody wanted them. And I took lists of names, and my manager at that time said, you shouldn't be doing that. And I said, well, maybe we'll get them in. And we did. We got 100 in, and I had this one particular lady that wanted a redhead, and I had put the redhead away for her. And she came in, and she said, oh, well, is there other ones I can look at? And I said, I'm sorry. You wanted the redhead. You've got the redhead. <laughs> Um, Larry, one of the things you were talking about is how a place like Sears allowed a guy from Peterborough to have a, a career job that took you literally around the world. 
Yeah, so I was quite fortunate because uh, so basically I went from a bicycle buyer, a bicycle, pardon me, assembler to uh, a bicycle buyer for all of Canada, and which did give me the opportunity to travel the world to Poland, uh, Korea, uh, Japan, wow. and all those areas, which was an education in itself. Mm -hmm. Then from there, I just progressed into uh, re retail management and ended up in Peterborough as the store manager. So this store closes down in late January, and, and here we are coming up to Christmas, the most special time, all of yeah. you were saying, for yeah. the store each year. Uh, you've been back to the store. What's it like? It's been difficult for me to go back to the store, but I have. I've done some of my Christmas shopping there because I always did Christmas shop there. Um, I just find it um, really sad because a lot of people won't know the kind of happy family relationship that we had there when we worked there. It was kind of like a second home for a lot of us. And uh, I'm just sorry to see that some of other people won't be able to uh, enjoy that kind of thing. I would probably say that I'm sad. I'm also a little angry, okay, yeah. the, the way things have happened. Uh, in my view, there was absolutely no reason for it to, to, to get to the point that it did. Uh, I think that it's sad that the people who worked at Sears for, for all those years, all of a sudden are going to have to change their lifestyle. To me, I just hope that our government does something that can assure the workers in Canada, that if they have a pension, that it is there in the, in the, with the terms that they were given at the start of their employment. So. Maybe we'll leave the last word to the woman who was there on the very day the store <laughs> opened. Uh, you know, we're talking about the impact this is going to have on, on the people who are working there. What about the impact of the closing the store on, on Peterborough? Yeah, I have people say to me, what will we do without Sears? Yeah. And I think we all feel that way because uh, it was such a good quality merchandise and, uh, and it's so sad to see it close. As part of our year-end coverage, we've been bringing you the stories behind our best images and introducing you to the great photographers and videographers we work with here on The National. So tonight, we feature a photo taken by Evan Mitsui. He found a way to make an anonymous portrait extremely personal. An image is powerful when it connects with a viewer. It, it's what's going to make you want to spend time with the story. The image that I've picked is a portrait of a, a woman whose identity couldn't be revealed. It's a story about human trafficking and um, you know, being lured into the sex trade. She's this intensely strong person who uh, has, has literally been through hell, but, um, you know, revisits it, kind of reopens that wound on a daily basis so that she can help other people. I hope that viewers of the photo and people who, who go into that story will, um, you know, come away with a sense of hopefulness that this, uh, you know, that the, at the end of the day, it's kind of a good news story and that this person has been able to to turn this really dark experience around. I think you can literally see the curtain kind of come up and it stops about here. And in the picture, it's, you know, it's the sun obscuring her face, but sort of the device is there and it's sort of slowly creeping up and maybe eventually it'll be gone altogether. She is beautiful. She's a very attractive person and confident. And I think that confidence comes through in the photo, all I really did was show up and push the button. So we have a sample of what was an intercepted in passengers' carry-on baggage over the past few days here at YVR. If we start over here, and uh, we, we, let's start with something that is very seasonal, um, an item that passengers may not associate with uh, restrictions, in aircrafts, but it's a snow globe. It's filled with liquid, more than 100 milliliters of liquid, and the rules for liquids in carry-on baggage is 100 milliliters or less. So this item would not be allowed in your carry-on baggage because of that. Other items like large knives uh, are not allowed 
in your carry-on baggage. Uh, axes, evidently. Uh, we'll have also items like torch lighters. They're not allowed. Lighters are allowed, but torch lighters are not. And you have items like this that are not allowed at all on an aircraft. Not in your check baggage, not in your carry-on baggage, because it's flammable and it's dangerous. So you have to leave that at home completely. Other items include a uh, saw that was intercepted just recently. And something also very popular that people will bring as gift is maple syrup. Now, it falls under the liquids, aerosols, and gels restrictions. And if it's more than 100 milliliters for your carry-on baggage, it has to be checked. It cannot be brought in your carry-on baggage. We have other items here, like a, uh, this is a replica of a grenade, but it's also uh, a torch lighter. So this is, is not permitted for two reasons, because it's a replica and because it's a torch lighter. So people actually brought these items with them? Absolutely, uh, within, within the past few days. What is the most unusual thing in here for you? For me, the most unusual thing is that bottle of rice wine here that has a uh, dead cobra inside and uh, inside the dead cobra's mouth is a scorpion, also dead. Um, but this, this to me is very unusual. The reason why it wasn't allowed isn't because of the uh, reptiles inside, it's just because of the amount of liquid that's in it. Uh, but it is extremely unusual to see that. But I mean, people thought they could bring that onto the flight? Yes, absolutely. Uh, whether it's this kitchen knife or this hammer, these, uh, these were intercepted in carry-on baggage. So was this uh, large knife. Now, there was a change with respect to small knives and carry-on baggage. So for domestic and international destinations, you can now bring small knives with a blade of less than 6 centimeters or 6 centimeters or less. Um, however, this knife, these two knives are much larger than 6 centimeters. It is also important to remember that box cutters and blades are not allowed at all. They are not part of the, the new rules. If you're traveling with a blade or a box cutter like that, it will not be permitted. When did the new rules come in effect for the blades? They came into effect on November 27th. And they are allowed at domestic and international destinations, but not if you're going through a U.S. checkpoint. So here at YVR, we have a checkpoint dedicated for passengers going to the U.S., and we have similar checkpoints at major airports across the country. Small blades, small knives are still not permitted at these checkpoints. On The National tonight, the UN Security Council has responded to North Korea's latest missile tests with stiff new sanctions. Members agreed unanimously today to cut the amount of fuel that the country is able to import by nearly 90 percent. They're also ordering all North Koreans working overseas to return home within the next 12 months. What was a very bad week for Bitcoin only got worse today as its value continues to tumble. Five days ago, the price spiked at nearly $20,000 US, but today it plunged below 11,000. Even a slight rebound later in the day did little to ease concerns that it is a bubble that may have burst. We're pulling in these goods, oh, see all these people in here. This, uh, this feels amazing. It's uh, emotional. Dozens of residents in Churchill, Manitoba cheered as a shipment of goods, including Christmas toys, arrived after a 25-hour ice road journey. The town of 900 has been without its only land connection since severe flooding damaged their rail line in the spring. Almost everything they've needed has had to be flown in at a steep cost for local people. About 9,000 kilograms of goods was brought in today, and amount crews hope to triple on future trips to the community. If Christmas in the UK feels different this time of year, it's probably because the country is heading toward big changes since it voted to leave the European Union. Brexit negotiations have been slow and difficult, the future uncertain. And as Thomas Degler tells us, it's led to something that could bring out the inner Scrooge in anyone. That last-minute grocery store dash, an unavoidable holiday tradition, 
prices go up every year, sure, but this time, British shoppers can't help but notice an especially big spike. Things that have, have risen in price have tended to be basic goods, vegetables. Steadily I've noticed it going up, but more so I suppose this year, I don't know if it's got something to do with Brexit. On UK shelves, about half of the food is imported, even simple stuff like bread and butter. Now everything imported is costing more, driving inflation here to a six-year high. And what's a British Christmas without tea and biscuits? Both have risen sharply this year, with tea up 8.5%, and some brands of biscuits up by as much as 25%. <laughs> and Brexit is partly to blame, lowering the value of the British pound, costing households here the equivalent of $700 a year, says this researcher. There is a rising inflation right after the referendum, which is mainly due to the fact that you have a sharp depreciation of the pound. For now, I think it's everything is more expensive. It's no coincidence food banks like this one are seeing their busiest period ever. One day this week, they served almost twice as many clients as usual. The holidays always mean budgets are squeezed, but this year, those handouts are in particularly high demand. As people's wages are going down and food prices are going up, it's very difficult for them to be able to not, to, to be able to get healthy um, ingredients. Across town at the grocery store, the owner, Mukesh Majithia, is seeing smaller profits and plans to raise his prices in the new year. He too blames the Brexit vote. People were so drummed up that they all wanted to come out without knowing the real facts. The effect is already a pinch on the pocketbook. And there's still another holiday season to go before Brexit. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. There were some wild claims in the lead up to the UK's referendum on leaving the European Union. The Remain camp forecast a recession if the vote went Brexit. The Leave camp touted vast economic benefits. Brexiters drove that point home on their bus, claiming Britain sent £350 million a week to the EU, money it could save. Analysts called that number misleading. The Remain camp's prophecy of recession didn't materialize either. Indeed, Brexit could someday be an economic boom for the UK. But according to an analysis by the Financial Times, so far, it's just a bust. Based on a variety of metrics, British economic performance has sagged since the referendum. The difference between where the country is and where it should be amounts to £346 million a week. That's right, if you believe those numbers, what's on that bus is actually pretty close to Brexit's weekly bill. Still ahead, you know who is getting ready. Only two sleeps till Santa's busy day and night. Just ahead, one of his helpers is sharing tales about his two decades as a mall Santa. It's interesting what little ones will ask for. Uh, I had one little three-year-old, a little boy, who sat on my lap and asked me for a yoga video. His dad looked so surprised and said, what happened to Thomas the Dream? It's become an annual tradition in the Kensington Market area, the Festival of Lights. It's based on the ancient traditions of the European Carnival, but it borrows from how many cultures mark this time of year. On the Hanukkah, on the eighth Hanukkah night. Hanukkah was celebrated with song and candles. That, along with the Christmas nativity, as well as the pagan solstice, were all drummed in with the parade and street performances. All in all, not a bad way to spend the longest night of the year. Cody, can you hold this for me? With more than a few final touches, the Kensington Carnival Festival of Lights is taking shape. The 12th annual event is designed to bring life and light to the market on the shortest and darkest day of the year. So worst case scenario is we can just cut them off for now and then we'll add new ones later. when we. Uh, there were like 30 or so kind of renegade puppeteers and artists who took over a few rooftops in the park. Since then it has grown from uh, you know, a total of about 30 people to about 3,000 people who now join us for our parade through the market. 
if you have it coming down like that, just okay. cut into it. Okay. So From the lantern making workshops, we came right into the making of props, of uh, sets, backdrops, costumes, just bringing all the scenarios to life. I drew them up about a week ago. They hear about the festival, they come out and they just contribute and they just work hard. The rewarding part is like to use scraps and bits and pieces from all over the place and then actually see it work. <laughs> One man is putting on this hat and it's going to be adjusted to his chin. This year's procession includes about 200 major costumes. Native, African, Jamaican, Jewish and Christian scenarios will be weaved into the production. It's for all of us to get together and have some fun outside of the normal structures and have a good time just being ourselves. Way over, way over, way over, way over. This is my fourth in the row and I, it's, it's all about celebrating winter, celebrating the changing of the seasons and, uh, and just about living and loving life. Debbie Lytle Kwan, CBC News, Toronto. Some version of that moment was lived by millions of kids on Christmas mornings in the 80s and early 90s. Many were wired in for life. The glitchy glory of 8-bit sound, the glowing lumps of pixels leaping from platform to platform. By today's technical standards, practically paleolithic. But as Eli Glasner explains, old consoles never die. They just go into extra lives. Ready to play? Let's begin. Mario and friends are leading a retro resurgence, thanks in part to the Super NES Classic, a mini version of the original 1990 machine packed with 21 preloaded games. Tempted? Good luck. Finding one of these is harder than rescuing the princess. Since it first went on sale in September, Nintendo's biggest problem has been stocking shelves. The same situation as what happened last year with Nintendo's first retro smash, the NES Classic. They sold a couple million of the NES Classic last holiday season. In both cases, they probably could have sold a lot more, but uh, these things basically aren't hitting shelves, really. So why the rage for retro? For the answers, we went to a store that specializes in classic video games. What are people getting out of something like this? We're grown men. Um, sort of, but we're not alone and these systems are selling out. So what's, what's driving this? Honestly, it's just nostalgia. It's, mm. it's what everybody's thinking. Uh, when you play this, it brings you back 20 years and you feel like a kid again. And those yeah. were the best times of our lives. We want to relive it. That desire to reconnect is rippling into mobile games. Some of today's biggest titles emulate the 16-bit graphics older gamers were raised on. On one hand, it's a challenge, um, of course because you have to sort of convey a lot with very little, but at the same time, it also allows our games to even be made. This game developer says the simpler style is now bringing new people into the industry. I think that it's really allowed all the people to make games easier um, and quicker. I think that that's allowed more voices to enter and more diverse voices to enter. <laughs> This is what the face of modern gaming looks like. Star Wars Battlefront 2 is stunning, complex, and expensive. Recently, Electronic Arts faced a player backlash from fans furious about being forced to pay extra for special characters. Not a problem with Mario. There's no reward system, there's no loot boxes, there's no microtransactions. It's, it's just you and a world to navigate and maybe a point system. At the Tilt Arcade Bar, the joy of playing is so popular they're moving to a bigger location. I think a big part of it's the tactile experience. It feels real. You don't need a full storyline to go through the game. I will put away the sophisticated games just to play these. I don't know. It's just like mindless, but it brings like just good memories with it. And with Nintendo bringing the Super NES Classic back for 2018, 
This retro resurgence has staying power. <laughs> Play it, Eli. Don't, don't give up, yeah, Eli. Don't give up. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. <laughs> when you put the red suit on and you step onto the set, put your ego in a box because after all is said and done, it's not really about you at all. It's all about the children. So when you glance at him, he may seem like your average mall Santa, but the Mr. Claus that we tracked down in B.C. seems to play the part like none other. We'll let him explain why. My name is Michael McCain. I'm 71 years old. And I've been a Santa Claus now for 21 years. I did a favor for some friends of ours uh, and played Santa Claus for them in their house on Christmas Eve. And I only had to have the first little three-year-old girl sit on my lap and look up at me with those big blue eyes, and I was hooked. Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas! I work at a car dealership as a day job, and they give me my holidays all in one month so I can play Santa Claus. Hi, Ellie, come on up. Look how big you've gotten. How old are you this year? What I love about being Santa Claus is the magic of the season, the belief that you see in their eyes and the utter awe of Santa Claus. It's just a magical time. It's a deceptively complex job. You can't just put a red suit on a white-haired guy and expect him to play Santa Claus in a believable manner. Everything we do in the red suit needs to be done in a way that supports and encourages a child's belief. What would you like for Christmas? What kind of a present? Um, a red one. A what? On a red one. A red one. Uh -huh. Well, okay. You never really know what a child's going to ask for. I've been asked for toothpaste. I've been asked for yoga videos. You just have to laugh and enjoy some of the things they come up with. All right, I can't promise these things, but I'll do what I can. Santa gets easy questions and he gets difficult questions. Questions like, I want my mommy and daddy back together, or I want you to cure my daddy's cancer. And at this point, Santa Claus just has to explain that some things I just can't make in a toy shop. But I usually offer then to go back to the North Pole that evening, gather all the elves together and Mrs. Claus, and if they'd like, say a little prayer that they get their wish. Hi, Not a crier in the bunch, this is good. good. <laughs> Santa Claus, of course, gets children of all ages. I think what adults seem to love, it, coming to see Santa Claus, is just the opportunity to relive being a child. <laughs> what language do you speak? Cantonese, actually. Cantonese, well, to you I would say, Sing Dan Phai Lok. Yeah. Yes, and you call me Sing Dan Lo Yen. <laughs> <laughs> see, Santa knows these things. Yeah. <laughs> I've learned how to say Merry Christmas now in well over a hundred languages. I did that because I noticed that so often that parents and grandparents would be with little ones and they spoke no English. And if I could say Merry Christmas to them, their eyes lit up just like the kids. Hey, hi there, big guy. Hi. I find it can be emotionally challenging for me at times, especially when I hold the little one in my lap and I get a flashback to my grandson who I lost at birth. And each little one I hold, I seem to experience two emotions now, one of sadness and another of just the utter joy of being able to hold a little miracle. I think also it taught me the value of life even more so. You know, you see these little ones in your arms and there are no guarantees in life. And you need to treasure every hour and every minute you have with them. I tell people, I may have lost one grandson, but in December I have thousands. You doing fine? At the end of a shift after a busy day of Santa Claus, I have to admit, I'm a tired puppy, oh, but I love doing it. So would you give me a hug? Oh, there we go. Merry Christmas. Santa Claus has grown to be a gentle, non-judgmental symbol of love, kindness, and unselfish giving. And who wouldn't want to play a character like that? Okay, let's go. I may retire from my other job, but I'll keep this job up as long as I can. Who knew the sweet philosophy of the mall Santa? <laughs> that is the National for December 22nd. Good night. Good night.